Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, late session. I know everyone's kind of ready to go out and uh, enjoy Dubai. But um, so today we're going to have a, a session on updates on the latest de developments in interventional valve therapies sponsored by Edwards. So kind of first we're going to split into two halves. Uh, first half focusing on TAVR and new updates in the technology on TAVR um, uh, with the Resilia valve. And then the second half we'll have a discussion on Pascal technology and mitral edge-to-edge -edge repair technology. So first I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, and we'll have about, after each talk, about 10 minutes of question and answers. So Dr. Raul Sharma uh, from Stanford University, um, expert uh, structural heart physician, who's going to talk to us about Sapien 3 Ultra Resilia. And, uh, thank you to Gulf PCR and uh, Edwards for having me at the symposium. Uh, my first time here in Dubai, so it's a pleasure to be here. And so over the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to discuss um, what's new in, in transcatheter um, heart valve therapy, particularly focused on the Sapien 3 Ultra Resilia platform. Um, these are my disclosures. I'm a consultant for Edwards, unpaid. Um, so when we think about, you know, I guess what's important for patients when we're doing these transcatheter procedures, the goal is really to minimize the number of reinterventions that are necessary. Of course, doing the index procedure well and successfully is critical, but I think that is obvious. But it's really about how can we optimize this procedure such that the patient will require a minimum number of procedures thereafter. And one of the biggest factors into that decision or the reality of how many procedures they're going to have is this issue of valve durability, which obviously gets a lot of airplay at a lot of the meetings. And why is durability important? I've had a lot of great conversations um, with a lot of learnings for me, particularly about the patient population here in the Gulf, um, and especially was surprised to hear about the lower, relatively lower life expectancy compared to patients in Europe or the United States. I think, though, the importance of durability still remains because you're just simply shifting the goalposts. So while these patients may not be surviving as long, it just means you're intervening earlier. And so the TAVA population, I think we've seen this happen in the Western world, and obviously we'll see it here, is expanding to a younger and younger population. And even those patients that are older are tending to live a little bit longer with a whole host of comorbidities. And so at least in the United States, the 2020 ACCAHA guideline update now recommends considering TAVA for patients who are 65 years and older as a class one indication. Now, obviously that might be a little bit younger here in the Gulf as these patients, as I mentioned, have a, a lower life expectancy, but the principle remains the same. We're now treating a younger, lower risk population. And so now more than ever, it's important to have a valve that's durable. And so we know that that index procedure, of course, has to have superior outcomes. We need to make sure that we preserve future options for valve and valve, for coronary access, lethal modification. But ultimately, it's all about how long and durable will that first valve be. Now, we've got data from the Sapien 3 experience. This is a propensity match study, the five-year outcomes of patients who are in the S3 intermediate trial, the Sapien 3 cohort from partner 2 S3i versus the partner 2A uh, SAVA cohort. You can see here the rates of structural valve deterioration comparable with, between the both groups um, in total at five years, but also related to uh, valve degeneration out to five years in terms of BVF and failure of those valves. More recently, and I think what was a lot of interest, particularly at TCT, was recently presented, was the five-year outcomes of data. And this was very eagerly anticipated. So there was a lot of interest as to how, in the modern era, would the low-risk P3 data look in terms of THV against surgery. And you can see here, we're not going to go into all of the results presented, but as it pertains to durability, the mean gradient sustained here out to five years with stable hemodynamics in the surgical arm versus the low risk arm. Now remember this wasn't just S3 valves, this included older generations of valves as well. But again, included in this group, aortic valve areas were maintained out to five years, again, comparable between surgery and TAVA. And importantly, ultra low rates of valve failure out to five years again. And this is really important when it comes to durability because durability is really underpinned by the need for another procedure, whether it's explantation of the valve in a surgical procedure or a valve and valve reintervention via a transcatheter procedure. And again, here you can see the rates, really low rates on both groups, but effectively no significant difference between the Sapien 3 and the surgical comparator. So as our experience has improved, we're treating younger patients, we're treating a broader range of patients, how has the technology improved to extend durability? And the ways in which technology addresses this issue is in terms of mitigating calcification, the tissue technology, the tissue material technology, hemodynamics, and PVL. 
And so when we look at the factors that play into uh, valve degeneration, there's structural valve deterioration, which is intrinsic, and that's related to leaflet calcification, wear and tear or flail. And then there's the non-structural, which is related to perivalvular leak and inappropriate positioning or sizing, which fortunately for the most part is a rare phenomenon. So if we focus firstly on the wear and tear aspect, we know that tissue durability is very important. The bovine pericardial tissue platform has been what's used by Edwards since the beginning in the surgical valves and have obviously transcribed across to the transcatheter valves. This is just an example um, of the comparison to the porcine valves here, which is why the Edwards platform is based on bovine tissue and certainly significant advantages in terms of which animal tissue is used uh, for the valve platform. The bovine pericardium has a f higher fiber density compared to porcine, which may explain in part some of the improved dynamic uh, tissue function you can see compared to the two there, um, which might portend to a better resistance profile compared to porcine tissue. When they do accelerated wear testing, there's excellent structural integrity. These valves are tested over a billion cycles, which is roughly equivalent to about 25 patient years. And this is again, similar to the comparative surgical valves. We know that we've been using this bovine platform for many, many years on the surgical side and now the transcatheter side. But what about leaflet calcification? It's a phenomenon that affects native valves and so too affects bioprosthetic valves. And this is where the resilient tissue has made a, a significant leap forward and the idea of advanced calcium blocking tissue technology. We know leaflet t uh, calcification affects all valves and certain patient substances is accelerated, such as those who advance renal dysfunction. Um, and here, the resilia tissue, and I'll show you how in a second, allows us to block that calcium complex formation on the tissue with the idea of extending the longevity, therefore reducing reintervention rates on the valve. The idea of fixation is not a new one. Over the years, there's been this idea of tissue preservation, stabilization of glutaraldehydes, and a variety of other tissue-related factors that when we come to the introduction of resilia tissue in 2017, which further improved upon prior tissue fixation uh, methodologies. So you can see there, it's been many years in the making. Um, certainly the surgical valves will first experience resilia as early as 2017. Um, there's been significant experience both in the aortic and the mitral space with the resilia tissue from the surgical perspective. And this is how it works. So basically there's cross-linking of aldehydes, which is essential to this tissue fixation process. Unfortunately, a side effect of that glutaraldehyde fixation is the introduction of these free aldehydes. And these free aldehydes are exposed to calcium, which creates a binding of this calcium aldehyde complex. And the idea of resilia tissue is to permanently cap those calcium attracting free aldehydes to prevent the locking of calcium to those aldehydes and therefore reducing calcification. The glycerolization process extracts water from the tissue matrix and replaces that water with glycerol, which from a practical perspective removes the need for liquid based storage which now then allows this unique dry storage, which further mitigates that calcium attracting glutaraldehyde residual, again, contributing to improved longevity of the valve. Now we know that accelerated calcification, at least in the animal model, demonstrates less calcium accumulation than in the resilia tissue valves. You can see there the control valve on the left, which is clearly more calcified than the resilia tissue on the, on the right. And when compared to the control, there was over a 70% reduction in the calcium content. So at least in the animal studies, this was proven to be true. But then the surgical experience gave us a body of human literature to further uh, provide credence to the idea that the resilient tissue really did work. This was a multi-center trial looking at these surgical valves out to seven years. Importantly, this was a younger patient population, so there's time for these patients to be observed. And you can see there that over 99% freedom from structural valve deterioration in these patients who are young, um, majority of male with probably a low to intermediate STS risk score out to seven years. The resilience trial is looking at patients who received their five-year follow-up as part of the commence study, and then specifically those who are younger than 65, so the lowest risk patients who are going to be uh, surviving the longest ideally, and looking at these patients even further than seven years, and this is still going on at the moment. And then this was a kind of a, a sub-analysis taking patients from the commence aortic trial, that surgical trial of resilia tissue, and comparing them to a historical cohort, which was the partner 2A SAVA cohort. So this was propensity matched patients, again, five-year outcomes, looking at structural valve deterioration related hemodynamic deterioration of greater than or two plus, according to the recent VARC3 definitions. And these patients were matched according to their baseline characteristics. And you can see there nearly a five-fold improvement in terms of outcomes out to 
five years with the resilia versus the non-resilia SAVA cohort. So what about non-structural valve dysfunction, paravalvular leak? As I mentioned, inappropriate positioning and sizing is luckily a relatively rare phenomenon now, but PVL continues to plague us somewhat. The Ultra Skirt technology, which you're all familiar with, S3 Ultra, um, important differences between the Sapien 3 and the Sapien 3 Ultra. Not just that the fact that the skirt is 40% tall and therefore there's a greater surface area of coaptation to mitigate that PVL, but importantly, there's a difference in design as well, moving from this flat woven to more of a textured fabric, which gives us, again, a 20%, uh, sorry, a 20 times greater increase in surface area contact, which further reduces that PVL in addition to the length of the skirt being taller. The cobalt chromium alloy frame remains the same between the Sapien 3 Ultra and, uh, and Sapien 3. And again, maintenance of that radial strength uh, to allow that valve to oppose to the native annulus and for the skirt to take effect um, is important here while maintaining integrity of the frame as well over time. You can see that in a large body of data in real world experience, the rates of significant PVL are extremely low, less than half a percent. Uh, less than 10% of patients have mild degree of PVL and over 90% of patients have no recorded PVL at discharge. This is a uh, larger body of, of evidence more recently, a meta-analysis from 2022, again, showing the importance of why we want to mitigate anything worse than mild PVL. I think early in our experience, we said that any PVL was bad. Then there was a pendulum uh, swing away to say that maybe moderate PVL is not so bad. But I think more contemporary data has shown us that certainly any degree of PVL greater than mild uh, does have adverse consequences, particularly as these patients are surviving longer. And you can see here with both these meta-analyses, uh, the Sapien 3 Ultra certainly had a better performance both in terms of mild PVL, but more importantly from a clinical perspective in terms of moderate and severe PVL as well. Why is PVL important? Uh, because it contributes significantly when we're thinking about durability to valve degeneration. And you can see here in this cohort of nearly 900 patients, roughly 20 patients had uh, all-cause failure, and the majority of these that were related to non-structural valve deterioration were because of perivalvial leak. So it, it is not a benign phenomenon. When we look at an even larger patient cohort here, nearly 14,000 patients, of the 50 patients that required re-intervention or redo TAVI, half of those were due to PVL. 22 of those were the self-expanding and three versus balloon expandable, beyond the scope of this talk, but suffice to say that PVL is of significant consequence, particularly when we're thinking about durability of these valves. So just to bring it home again, these are the four kind of elements we look at in terms of structural and non-structural valve deterioration, modifying lethal calcification with the introduction of resilia tissue, the wear and tear on these valves in terms of long-term durability with the bovine pericardial platform, mitigating PVL with the ultra skirt, and then of course being judicious in terms of positioning of these valves and appropriate degrees of over or undersizing. Overall, Sapien 3 Ultra has set a very high bar for performance with excellent clinical outcomes. Rates of stroke uh, and death are incredibly low at one year. Rates of PVL are incredibly low. We didn't talk about pacemakers, but the rates of pacemakers, new need for a new pacemaker is roughly 5 to 6%. Importantly, preserving the ability for future transcatheter options, either leaflet modification, coronary access, or future valve and valve. But importantly, as we think about durability, the introduction of the resilia tissue may further improve upon these already excellent results to ensure that we are minimizing the number of reinterventions for these patients in the future. Thank you. Fantastic, Raul. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, I forgot to introduce my panelists, uh, Dr. Mohammed Belrith, Dr. Abdullah Lanezi, and Dr. Sunda Samarqandi. Well, let me start with you. So with Ultra, we saw, for those of us that put it in, something that we saw tangible. So we saw there's less leaks. We had to post-dilate less. It was a very clear result. The Resilia valve, we see this data. It looks good. But like as one of my surgical colleagues used to uh, says to me all the time, every valve looks good at five years. So what, 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 are you, what are your thoughts or what are we seeing that makes you feel that this is really going to prove clinically relevant? So I think the acute results are a bit more subtle. I think the delta between um, XT and, and uh, S3 and S3 Ultra um, was a little bit more obvious as you alluded to. I think from our perspective, uh, at least in all the cases we've done, what I'm noticing is that we're not seeing any evidence so far of early valve degeneration, either from the surgical valves, the inspirous valves that have the resilient tissue, or the S3 Ultra Resilia valves that we've been putting in for the last couple of years in the US. 
Um, and so I think that's reassuring because, to be honest, we, we've all seen early valve degeneration on the surgical and transcatheter side. We're seeing less of that with the Resilia platform. So I think obviously time will tell if that's a, a long-term sustained effect. And then as you alluded to, as we look at data, you know, the five-year data that was presented at TCT did not include S3 Ultra Resilia valves. So when we look at the seven-year data in a couple of years, and of course, everyone wants to see the 10-year data, then there's going to be a significant proportion of valves in there that are S3 Ultra Resilia. And then I think we'll be able to really tease out whether there's a difference between earlier technology um, platforms and the newer technology platforms in terms of hemodynamics, durability, et cetera. So Dr. Mohammed, let me ask you a question. So nowadays we used to, you know, before every Taver meeting was about outcomes, pacemakers, et cetera. Now it seems like you go to every meeting, everyone's talking about lifetime management durability. and durability. So we're, we've, we're kind of, everyone still thinks about the short term. So the short term and getting out of the procedure and good outcomes in your procedure. How do you put it together? How does durability factor in? How does, uh, you know, the issues of perivalve leak when you're making your decisions on which valve to put in? I think we learn a lot. We start the TAVI program here in this area, maybe before the American, because they were in, in, in trials and we were in real life. It's like, at least in Riyadh, we are 13 years plus to 14. And we start with the old generation. Uh, and I, I, I can assure you 100% the valve leak was a big issue. And some of the patients, still very small number, they ended by having surgery eight months or 10 months after. And you know, the surgery not easy in those uh, TAVI patients. But when we think now, yesterday we presented few cases from two platforms who had degeneration in five to six years only. With the present, actually second generation of the valves we have here in the area. And keeping in mind our patient, they are younger in age, but actually their body is older than Western patient. And we know from the coronary artery patient, our patient here is younger 10 years. And the valvular patient, I'm sure, what we see, they are younger than the Western patient. And the deterioration they have is, is a big issue. And I think durability, when we talk about it, would, and we see this, those optimistic technology coming, I, I think I feel a little bit more relaxed because I'm having trouble already and I don't know how to solve it. We solve a lot of problems with pacemaker, with the new technology and the ceiling with OS, uh, most of the valve nowadays, the BVL is, is minor. And a lot of them, you know, they are doing great, even with the mild. We leave it now in the cath lab. And uh, the PBM is an issue. And again, with CT sizing, uh, good matching between the patient findings and which valve you're going to use, we, we learn a lot. We change our practice. And even the protocol of the CT, when we start with our colleague from Europe, and now it's changing a lot. And I think what we are looking for is to have a TAVR valve similar to the surgical colleague. And when you have a surgical guy in the team, he always talk about his, you know, uh, performance and his result from, from uh, the surgical point of view. But I think this is a very promising and I think it might help some of our patients. Abdullah, let me ask you. So, you know, I, I, we've looked at our data. So our, num our average age is 71. So it's younger than partner three. <laughs> This is, this is the reality of the region. I'm sure your, 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 no, your ages are similar. And you get these very young patients, mm. they're insisting on TAVR. Yes. You know, they just absolutely refuse surgery. And 60, 62, 63. Um, how do you kind of put all this together when you're deciding? Coronary access, probably a need for a second and a third. When you're planning your procedures, you know, durability, you know, uh, superannular versus uh, annular valve. How do you kind of factor all these things in to kind of decide I'm going to do X valve for X patient? You know, this is a great question. I mean, pre-procedural planning is much more complex now than it used to be. And in the past, we just wanted to do a procedure with no major complication, get the patient out safe with a, with a functioning valve. But now we have, as you said, the younger patients, we have patients that are coming back with failed transcatheter valves. And now when we are pre planning the procedure for this patient, one of the major questions I have in mind, how many transcatheter valves is the patient gonna need? 
And majority of our patients, at least they're going to need uh, two transcatheter valves. So you have, you have to, to have that in your decision making about what valve to use. And, and to be honest, uh, the, the, the Sapien valve has the advantage of being a short valve, which is a great with regards to coronary access, which is a, uh, gives you a better option when you're planning uh, transcatheter valve and valve in the future. And improving the durability is, is, is adds to that in terms of lifetime, lifetime management. But I think a very important question, now we are doing, as you said, much younger patients. So when you're putting a t transcatheter valve in an 80 years old, it's not the same as putting it in a 60 years old, because we know younger people tend to uh, consume their transcatheter valves much faster. So I think this highlights the importance of improving the technology uh, that can ultimately improve the durability for the transcatheter valves. I mean, I, I just literally this morning was dealing with a patient I admitted six, you know, she's 72 now, but had a very small valve put in a very small annulus and completely sequestered everything. Right. And so now I'm like stuck. She's 72, so even higher risk for surgery. So, you know, making those proper decisions at that initial time kind of is so critical because... Th that's a surgical we valve? Play. No, it was a prayer. It was Taver. She insisted at that time. But, but I another can site. assure you nowadays, even the surgical people or surgical colleague, they are using the data from uh, from the CT scan measurement, and they are improving their practice. Less and less mismatch we see since we start the TAVI program. You know, another thing that now everybody knows about transcatheter valves. So all of our patients know about transcatheter valves. So when they come, they, they that's what they request, and. Now, even the surgeons are referring patients for transcatheter valves because they see the patients doing well, no major complications, and they are doing less of less of surgical um, aortic valve replacement. But the surgeon and the program, you will have more cases. Now, Roel, uh, so obviously you probably deal with a different population than we deal with here. How do you kind of go about, and let's say you get a 65-year-old who you're doing TAVR and kind of very well healthy, and you think this patient's gonna be around 20, 30 years? Yeah, I think the conversation in the United States has shifted. I think maybe f three to five years ago, a patient who's young, healthy, low risk, like you're describing, let's say 65, because that's what the guidelines say, um, we would have said, if there's no reason to have TAVR, you should have surgery as a first line. That was the old conversation. Um, and the idea was, okay, we'll put in a surgical valve at 65. Let's say it lasts you 10 years, then you're set up for a valve and valve. Uh, and then after that, no one was really thinking. But to your point, they're probably gonna need two. You know, they're gonna live well into their 80s. Now the conversation is more about, well, can we get a transcatheter valve in now? And if that lasts you 10 years and then you're 75, so arguably if life treats you well, you're still low risk. Now, of course, the surgeon has to explant that TAVA valve at that point, but certainly surgery is feasible for the second procedure. And thereafter, they'll only need one transcatheter procedure. Or if you put a 29 valve in now at 65 and it lasts them you know, 10 years, maybe you could put another 29 or a 26 in there and that's enough to get them through. So that conversation now is being had and the way at least we see our patients is myself and the surgeon together at the same time, having the conversation with the patient and explain to them that we don't know what the right answer is. And you know, there's two or three combinations or permutations for the combination of your next two or three procedures. And one patient might say, you know, I'm currently the CEO of my company, I'll have a tavern now and put off my second procedure, even if it's surgery and it's a bit more complicated versus another patient might say, no, I just want surgery now because you're telling me it'll last perhaps a bit longer. And you know, the thing we haven't talked about is, is you know, the surgeons, I think I agree with you, are now taking a little bit more ownership on, on performing that first valve surgery a little bit better. We're doing CTs on everyone, even if they're surgical patients, and doing a lot more root enlargements, which weren't being done so commonly before. Like we shouldn't see 19 millimeter surgical aortic valves in, in, in normal adult size um, people. Um, and the other thing that I don't know if they do a lot here is the ROS procedures now coming back into favor in the United States, particularly for these younger patients. So I think the surgeons are also, you know, kind of Work. upping their game as well. But to answer your question, it's, it's an individualized conversation, but now the conversation is no longer simply surgery, then TAVA, it's TAVA or surgery first. And th those of us who, to bring your point, those of us who calculate STS scores on every patient, the SDS on the same patient maybe five, six years ago would have been four and 5%, now it's 2%. Yeah. I mean, so I think TAVR and this data collection 
has pushed surgeons to be better. Yeah. I mean, they're, 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 the surgery has also gotten better. So just let me ask you, so, okay, so now you're, ah, go ahead. I have a question just to Sharma. Uh, I have read an article as an editorial to compare the uh, S3 Ultra versus the Resilia. And the uh, effective uh, orifice area is larger in Resilia, and the hemodynamics is better. While the frame is the same, the tissue is the same. How would you explain this uh, change in the, or difference in the hemodynamics and the effective orifice area while we have the valve design the same? Yeah, I think from a mechanistic perspective, my only explanation would be that the pliability of the leaflets changes. Um, we know that, that, that um, the aldehyde calcium complex formation is not gonna be instantaneous. Um, and certainly there is a threshold time effect with it. And so the only explanation I could have mechanistically between the, diff the difference in EOA and gradients and hemodynamics would be that the pliability of those leaflets with the resilia tissue is gonna be better than without the resilia tissue. Therefore, you'll get better opening of the valve, better EOA translates to better hemodynamics. Um, but I don't imagine that you would see that acutely. You would have, some, have to have some time for that difference to develop. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And just uh, for the anti-calcification, you are addressing one mechanism of uh, durability issue. There are other mechanisms that uh, uh, basically Edward has been building up uh, the research over the years, building in a, in a good surgical valve previously. My question to you is this dry fixation, does it affect the shelf life? Uh, is there any storage problem within the valve for this dry fixation for the valve? And the second question, you showed us nicely uh, data and animal. Is there any, the surgical valve has been used for a couple of years. Uh, is there any data from uh, surgical literature to show if there is a failure in the resilia, is the mechanism the same as the paramount or a different mechanism? So I'll address the first question um, about the longevity of the valve. I don't know, I don't know if there's anyone in, in the audience from Edwards who can answer that. Jack. Jack. The microphone, Jackie. We currently have some data on uh, on the Inspiris Resilia. Uh, we just published the seven years follow up, uh, and uh, and and that's where you will find out. You know, there's like a very minimal SVGs that that has been described so far. No, he means shelf life the on the shelf. On the shelf life on the tissue is exactly the same. So it's four years shelf life on the Resilia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the second question, um, which I was just going to reiterate, is that. With the data that is so far from the surgical literature, the rates are uh, incredibly low. So lower than the, you know, the uh, partner 2A comparators for the surgical valves. But only time will tell on the transcatheter side when we get that denominator as to whether that improvement is sustained on the TAVA side as well. So, no, like one more question, Sundas, for you. Um, so when you were talking about the durability, you know, so the arguments are always going to be made about a superannular valve having better gradients. Does the, do you th does that number one factor into your equation when you're when you're deciding on your valve choice? Number two, that's an that's known evidence. This is theoretical, right? So we're talking about theoretically that we're going to have more durability. Yeah. So in terms of like a question, rephrasing the question, the choice of the valve, uh, is it just depending on hemodynamics solely, predicting the durability will be better or not? So, um, well, the first valve choice matter. This is, we have to come to a conclusion with that. You don't look at just from hemodynamic perspective or short frame or long frame. You have to look at the, the whole picture together. You have to put patient, age, comorbids, and the background, and the anticipation of what is the next step afterward. Second of all, you look at the CT parameter. Sometimes, yeah, maybe it favor a balloon expandable valve, but the patient anatomy doesn't allow it, so you have to go with whatever you have. Then the coronary accessibility has been the caveat for the last, I don't know how many years. Um, Edward has been phenomenal during the last few years. Accessibility hasn't been a major issue, but still it could happen, whereas the other toll frame has been an issue. But, you know, technology has been advancing. Every company is improving their outcome. So you cannot say one size fits all. You have to pick it all in consideration. And the, finally, the operator experience. Excellent. So on that note, we'll go on to our next uh, portion. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sundar Samarghandi, who's going to be talking to us about mitral tear and the Pascal precision system. OK, 
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So my presentation is basically very simple. It's like a prim primarily, it's not that elegant as Dr. Sharma, but it's an introduction of the precision system of Pascal in uh, the region. So we have seen like Edward Lafsanz have developed a broad portfolio of therapies over the course of the last seven, eight years, and starting with the cardio band and then proceeding with the Pascal mitral H2H -H repair, and then introducing the new implants with the Pascal A system in the mid 20s, uh, 2020, and then introducing the stabilizing rail system, and finally the precision system in 2022 with further innovation. And the beauty of this system that it can tackle both valves, uh, I mean, at the same time without needing to change the system. So once you have it, you can tackle both valve if you need to. So it's been, as we can see, it's not just about the system itself, it's also about the implant. So we can see the progression and the technology that came in behind that having a spacer may help and decrease the stress and, dec and predictable more gradient and having more MR reduction and maybe M predictability of MR sustainability of results. And then came the ACE to have more lesser or simpler portfolio to help the imager to detect you and see you. And of course, then the stabilizer to make everything in space and then the precision for stability of the clocking. Just, this is just giving you like a hint about how was the old generation or the first generation uh, available. I'm not focusing on the guides, basically the same or the steerable, but in the implant, you can see there's multiple knobs, multiple wires and stuff like that. It was like a tedious procedure to release the implant at that time. In compare now, very elegant tube-like uh, implant, very easy, very delicate, and even color-coded, as you can see at the end of it, the gray and the black. Um, I think this one is can see, if in case you have the independent grasping. The second is the having the versatile configuration with the clasp at the end, having more, let's say, friendly interaction with the leaflet in case if you're having dealing with the elderly, let's say female, small body, and you have a fear of maybe you have, might harm uh, the leaflet with multiple uh, capture. And of course, you can just talk about the science, but you have to prove it with multiple studies has been published latestly in the TCT showing the good outcome and comparable outcomes to the competitors. So this is the overall over the system in basic, so you can take a leisure. So going to a case, this is a 50 years old lady, having multiple comorbids, ejection fraction is uh, impaired, it's a functional MR, she's been uh, heavily in medication despite that she's been having recurrent ER visit and uh, heart failure admission in the last six months prior to this presentation. We have a severe dilated LF atrium, severe functional MR, and the peer pressure is still holding. So I will just go with the live in a box case, I think we can hear the voice, I don't know if you can hear it. Okay, so the whole case is about 20 minutes or 20 plus minutes, and I have just like basically... Usually we'll start our yeah. case by screening first. Uh... So this is Dr. Zakaria, our imaging. I think most of our people in this room are accustomed by him. Uh, he's been a constant... constant uh, Imager in my cases and even in the meeting. The so he usually Either he start with me in the screening method. So I'll just color, cross it. Try to, to see where is the location of the MR and decide the, your uh, to this will help you in positioning of the of the device and the clocking of the device. Um, important to, uh, part of the assessment is to assess the mitral valve area by the uh, multiplanar uh, reconstruction where you have to put the uh, cursor and the tip of the commissures in the two in the green box and then the red box and in the blue you will have the short axis of the mitral valve and you can trace it easily and in here it's 5.5 uh, centimeter square um, this is the as uh, baseline assessment of the mitral valve. Part of the, also of the assessment um, is to measure the mitral valve gradient. And here the baseline is two millimeter of mercury. Oh, sorry. So yeah, as you can see, quickly going uh, through the, uh, the, uh, 
the screening of the case, we can see a central functional MR. You have a decent posterior length of the mitral leaflet, and the also in addition to the gradient was, as he mentioned, it was one, so it wasn't an issue to proceed with the case. We have some indentation, as you can see here and here in the posterior between P1 and P2, P2, P3, but it will overcome because all the JIT is coming from A2, P2. So the strategy was to go in the middle, having a clocking of 12 to 6 in the middle exactly, and you go from there. Okay, so I, the, uh, I will go exactly where is the case here. You can see it's very stable. It's a 22 French, very stable, at least from a female perspective. I don't have to struggle to push the device across the groin or even struggle through when we cross the transeptal. You can see very delicate, very simple movement of the device. It's very stable and very seldom movement. I'm just coordinating with Zakaria what is needing. You can see I'm a bit in the lateral trajectory, and he was asking me if you can pull. So that's what I was all doing. I'm just pulling the system, just uh, unlocking the lock system and just pulling it simply to adjust it. And while going with the steerable to go for the meat anterior and uh, posterior here. So you can see there's no much fuss around the table, no much movement. And as you can see, my clocking was a bit off here. We would want it to be, and we were, as we said, we were a bit in the medial side here because of the breathing, and we will shortly ask the uh, anesthesia. I'm here asking the anesthesia to stop the breathing for a second to see the effect. So it's a good catch also, like you ask. You can see we just like switch directly going more medial here. So me and Zakaria were discussing, should I move more clocking, go clocking clockwise, and should we descend? And you can see the jet really here. So we agreed uh, after that brief discussion that we will go in the middle without need for breathe hold or anything. So here I'm just like adjusting the position. We adjusted the clocking. The clocking, you just have to clock here. Simple. It's not a major thing. It's not much. It was much. The precision gave you more stability in compared to the old generation. Here you can see I'm just wheeling. I'm closing the device. Okay. I'm ending my position with some anterior and posterior. And now we're going to go with an implant here. You can see my hand going very gently and slowly. We are good. And there you go. Do you want to put some color before we open? Yep. So the decision now, OK, are we good? Before we're confirming we the position. Back. Maybe a bit we're moved medial or lateral, but look fine. We're in the middle. So we decided here to proceed and open the device again, as you can see with the wheel. It's very important to have a good communication with your imager. Like, it's not like a one line or one direction uh, talk. It's uh, back and forward between both of us to have a good uh, agreement in what to do in each step. So I was a bit uh, deep, as you can see. So I pulled it with my, you can see, right hand, and at the same time I was pulling. OK, and you can see here adjusting the position. Let, let, let me just check something for you. No problem. Oh, Go just ahead. a second. My two lat media. Yep. I think. So okay. that's the communication no that we're having. He already like media. he stopped me. That's Don't move. Let me check where you are. And, you and he's checking the clocking. And you better? can see we were like in the Counter beginning. I was countering a bit, so you can see already I am at the, like, let's say 11:30. Here and that wasn't our trajectory. Trajectory will be uh, 12 to 6. So he's now fixing and directing my adjustment of okay. my clocking. You Good. have to fix yourself here. And that's what I'm going to do shortly. <laughs> so you can see here the leaflet are really nicely going in in terms of the posterior. You have to get it all the way in the apex. Okay, and here I'm just pulling to have good angulation of both. Once I'm happy, I'm just preparing. I just moved, moved the lock to decide here with the gray and blue, uh, sorry, black, to have both. And now you can see I dropped, but the anterior, I didn't get it much. So I think I went in independent grasping here. I'm not sure. I think I went together. So we're adjusting now here. We can see the anterior here. We have the posterior. Not, We were not happy with this posterior. And now we have the anterior, if you notice the clasp going down. So I think I was going for more independent grasping here to amend it. But so again, I was not much of a happy, so I think I opened it and closed it again. This is, again, one of the advantages of the device. Like, I don't feel like, you know, insecure of going up and down, up and down, or closing it, because I feel I'm secure. Even if I did it multiple times, I'm going to be fine. I'm not going to injure the leaflet. 
with degree. So you can see still we were not happy about the posterior leaflet here. We have some, still there is some MR, and we have some bouncing in the posterior mitral leaflet. So we are gonna go with optimizing that. So I think when we optimize it here, you can see still some bouncing. We're making everything, like what I'm doing here is releasing the, the tension in the system as much as possible. And you can see as I'm opening here, what is gonna happen, I'm gonna check the posterior. So I went with the posterior away with me with the steerable and I started to open or raise the clasp of the posterior leaflet and there you go, it was out. So from the beginning, I didn't have enough of posterior leaflet though, so it was a good thing that we didn't like take it for granted and say, okay, we have 70% MR reduction and proceed. So we knew at that end that we didn't have a good posterior. So I did it like a calculated measure that, you know what, the anterior even, I have to move a lot and adjust a lot. So just let's get, the anterior is fine, it's easy to grasp. So let's release both and get both together again. So you can see here more there in the apex, as I can see in the uh, right side of your screen, but the posterior is going in and out of the apex. And you don't want it to be here, you want it exactly in the apex. So once you have both together, this is where you're gonna time your timing and you can just you know close or drop your clasp using with your, uh, right. And this is where I dropped my clasp here, okay? I think I got uh, better. I would think we have another attempt afterward. So we're gonna close now using the black wheel or we have it improved. We were not in the cl best clocking position. That's why we didn't get the anterior. So we had another attempt. I think this is the third attempt. The whole case is exactly, as I said, 20 plus minute is the whole case. It didn't take us more than that. With the, let's say the transeptal, seven minutes. So the whole case was less than 30 minutes. So this is life, like step of step, like I didn't edit any or remove, just remove the transeptal. So you can see, so one of the reasons that we weren't getting much of the posterior, first of all, one of them, the clocking wasn't right. Second of our position wasn't right. So now we're in a good, better position. We adjusted our clocking. And now you can see all both leaflets are lying just inside. I'm just, just pulling the implanter now, using my right hand here and just tweaking anterior posterior with my left hand. So I like this having the stabilizer or the table, or the rail system, it became everything stable because with the old generation, everything was falling apart. Like, you know, something going right and left and you have to control, not only with your both arms, you have to control with your legs sometimes. So anyways, we have better visualization, better attachment, we're adjusting just final results, dropping the clasp. You, have, you can see that we have much, much better posterior insertion, and even the anterior here, you can see it. And this is where we basically now are closing. I'm just relieving some tension because if I was moving more posterior, I'm just amending my position. So it's not like you know rocket science or anything. It's just anterior, posterior, pull and push, okay? I'm amending here what I did like, just I optimized the anterior as you can see. Here we closed. And now we are in the MR assessment phase. We have some JIT here and our interpretation at this stage was maybe we have some uh, tension in the system. Our gradient was I think one or two. Our pulmonary was uh, forward pressure. And this is our imaging we're taking. You know, I think you have too much flexion in your guide because I, did, I need some to flex the guide here a bit when I was introducing. You can see now he's going to go for the tissue bridging. Excellent, double orifices. And I think we have like, he, we just checked the pulmonary and he's just like reviewing again the capture because you always have to save your capturing. It's not like I'm opening again to just review, make sure you didn't have partially uh, of the leaflet. So we decided now to already deploy. In contrast to the first generation, you can see it's very simple. We will just take the first wire. <laughs> uh, here we're just going to go through our checklist. That's what we were holding for. The first glass wire is out. You can see there is some tension. If you can see there is like here, the friction here. So first wire out. 
Now the second wire out will be. I don't, be, I don't need to hold the system because it's already locked. There is a mechanism of locking system there on the side, if you're uh, just for your knowledge. And now I just want you to hear the clicking voice. So the beauty of this is not anymore. I should have incorporated some uh, fluoroscopy, but for whatever reason we didn't, but there you go. Almost there. So you will see it will be detaching soon. There you okay, go. Okay, and now we retract. I'm just pulling the implanter. Yeah, so the beauty here yeah, that I don't have a needle to be worried about. I'm just, just pulled it back a bit and now he's assessing whatever. I'm just adjusting this guide. The other beauty, or this is just another experience um, observation, that the MR actually uh, in the Pascal in specific, after release it gets better. Okay, in contrast to, let's say, the competitor, okay? So you can see we have a very excellent uh, MR. This was the MR prior to the release, if you can see here in this screen. And uh, my imager, Dr. Zakaria, was mentioning, I think you have too much uh, tension because of your friction here. So, but we had like, you know, confident by our, that's why we took some time to have a checklist, making sure that we have a good grasp, good perpendicularity or clocking. And now after we release, everything just got better. And uh, we're just now removing system very gently. Now, um, I just pulled the whole uh, implant uh, delivery system inside of the steerable. And me, usually, as like, you know, me and Zachary always have to be very careful in taking the system out because before I remove the system or the guide, confirm, do you want me to do anything else? Is there everything is good? So that's what he was checking for me. So you see, there is no like, you know, take the guide out, take something, take the needle out, no. Just stay, stay give him time to release and uh, amend the, uh, his images. And what I'm doing here, because he cannot find my guide here because I was too much posterior. So what I'm doing here is listing the posterior by unflexing a bit. And now he found me, said, okay, I can find you now. So there we're like, you know, I'm flexing a bit, unflexing, sorry. And I, go, and I met, forgot to mention that you have, in the steerable, you have a side arm that you can simply do the hemodynamics and observe the hemodynamics throughout the case. And the tension or the blunting of the dynamics is less in compare because there is no much of a system, it's not an all system, and it's all interacted. Like when you have three different sectors, the tension is less and the, and the results, as you can see, it's very good. Removing uh, the system is very easy. To proglide, the case is concluded here. So we're just having final, and by that, I thank you for your listening. And we have opening the fall for discussion. Thank you, Sundas. Fantastic case, uh, really nicely done. Bro, let me ask, start with you. So from my, what I'm hearing from the US, so after co-opt, still, most of my friends are telling me they're still doing mostly degenerative or relatively higher degenerative compared to functional. We tend to have a lot more functional in this region. Do you see, do you see any, what do you see in your practice or in, why do you think kind of in spite of the data, the practice hasn't changed as much as we would think? I think the, um, you know, I think if you look at the uh, mitral clip commercial volume, at least in the U.S., Roughly 60% is for FMR and 40% and for DMR. I think the the reason we're not seeing now, I will say that, you know, I'm seeing more DMR coming through my practice. Um, the reason I think things didn't really change significantly after COAPT is that these patients are mostly managed by heart failure doctors. And for us in the US, it's been really tough in spite of COAPT being so strongly positive to convince the physicians, the heart failure physicians who look after these FMR patients that edge-to-edge -edge repair has a significant benefit. And it's in parallel with their goal-directed medical therapy. I think the issue is that for some reason they think of edge-to-edge -edge repair almost as an end stage at times palliative procedure where only after they have spent months to years painstakingly increasing their furosemide by 20 milligrams a day 
um, you know, contemplating VAD, contemplating transplant, getting knocked back, then they call and say, would this be a good mitral clip candidate? And by that point, you know, you're outside the, the co-apt criteria, more like mitral France criteria. I think that's one thing. The DMR patients, I think um, the reality is they're being operated on. And so, you know, our surgeons, you know, Joe Wu and his team at Stanford, they'll take an 85-year-old uh, and repair their valve. Um, and so that's, I think, overall why the numbers for edge-to-edge -edge repair in the U.S. are low for, for both those reasons. You know, we have the repair MR study going on at the moment, which is taking intermediate risk patients who have degenerative mitral regurgitation and randomizing them to have either surgical repair or uh, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, and I think that hopefully will move the field forward. But I think the big issue is the referral bias and, and the lack of referrals. Abdullah Muhammad, do you see the opposite problem? I see it sometimes in our region where people have them on almost no therapy, and then they see some MR on an echo severe, and they say, clip it. Uh, we see both extremes. So sometimes if, the heart failure guys have, hang on too long. If you have a surgeon... In, in the hospital or in the team. You're going to see the big competition between us and them. And most of our cases will go into the MDT meeting or, uh, you know, the conferences we do. Um, but I think with this development in the technology, we are doing the degenerated uh, bad cases done with both uh, platforms, and we had an excellent result, to be honest with you. Even the surgeon, they are very surprised. And one of them, that guy with LVAD, we did a great job because he was waiting on the transplant and there was some issue for his transplant. We ended by doing his rupture cordy with, with the two devices and he is doing great, even his ejection fraction. And now they are to think about removing his LVAD and he, he was dropped. And few cases done, uh, very bad degenerative type. And I agree with you, the majority of our patients, they're functional, but still we get a mixed morphology. You know, some of them, they are not pure, pure. There is some rheumatic disease in this area of the world. Th those cases, they are not very clean. I, th I feel the challenge, because sometimes I feel like we get two of the extremes. Like we get sometimes somebody on nothing, and so you, you, know, you have to tell your referring doctor politely, let's try a little bit of medical therapy at least, or the opposite extreme where the heart failure guy is the guy patients basically pre-listing or pre-VAD, and keep, you're doing a lot of mitra keep, bridge. Keep, keep in mind, with the new medication... And it works, but it's just, yeah. they're not fun to do The new cases. medication for heart failure, it's improving the situation, to be honest with you. Some of the patients on our list, now we took them away from the list for percutaneous or even surgical intervention. Yeah, so uh, we, we have the same thing. We have uh, most, most of our practice is uh, functional MR. We have a very good fun heart function team, so majority of the patients are well treated from a medical standpoint, and I agree. I mean, the, the advancement in medical therapy had made a big difference, but I think the understanding in the heart failure specialist has improved with regards to the MR being the main cause versus the heart failure being the uh, main cause. And many times they actually push us to, to proceed with the patient earlier than waiting for the LV to balloon out. And from a surgical standpoint, the surgeons usually don't like to do the functional as you can, as you can tell. But also they actually um, pushed us to do a few cases post MI, MR that they usually they say, well, if we take them, they usually die. So we've done um, a few successful cases, I have to say, with Impella support, and they, they, the patients did really well. So just one of the things I was discussing with Abdullah before, I kind of, mitra clip, I kind of feel very comfortable with the four sizes. I'm still, you know, we re just relaunched our Pascal with the precision and the ACE and everything. I'm still not, a, I don't have a clear, as clear of an algorithm in my mind when to use ACE versus P10? What's kind of your practice? So if you're comparing, it's just like my go-to is ACE, to be honest. Yeah, in the beginning, when we started in 2020, we might have some P10s, but usually my go-to is ACE, in either in mitral or tricuspid, that's one. Um, it's very easy to be visualized, seem, and if you want to make it like head-to-head, -head, it's like, like a, basically an XTW. So you have some comparison. There's lots of slides that we are aware about. It's just the length. One is 10, one is 12. That's it. Other than that, they're basically almost, almost let's say, similar. Now, P10, I have been utilizing it in people like with a grain of salt. Let's take that. Um, in people with their area is a bit on the fence, let's say. 
Okay, so there are the patients that I want to utilize the spacer more. And I have a couple of patients, so as I said, this is like just an experience, an observation. We put the P10, our gradient inside of the procedure was the same as the next day in transthoracic because we have seen this, like, you know, you do a clip, excellent, gradient is two to three, next day is six, what's going on, what's happening, all oh, the anesthesia effect, whatever. Which is, it's not the same with, not to some extent with the Pascal area. So that in answering, make it short, whenever I have a concern, at least, about a gradient, and I know that whatever is the reason for that, and my fear that I cannot put more than one device or more than one implant. Maybe I'll be learning toward P10, but to, fit, to make it realistically more in the last, I think, I don't know, 2023, P10 become phased out, to be honest, like very, very slowly, because we have seen comparison result with ACE. And another advantage of ACE, like if you wanna go more commercial, more lateral or medial, it's very easy. You can even go elongated, whereas in the P10, it's doable, especially with the elongation option, but it will be the life of your imager more difficult. I, I think just to add to that, you know, ACE is by far and away, at least in the US, the majority the use majority. device. I think ACE, the retention elements on ACE uh, provide greater tissue retention than P10, which is advantageous, particularly for degenerative MR. But the the ben inherent benefit in that can also sometimes come back to bite you, no pun intended, um, in fMR, where the leaflets are thin and friable. And so the one place I see, you know, I use a little bit of P10 is where I don't want to put so much tension on the leaflets. And that, to your point, I use the spacer to bring them into the spacer, not to the central um, device. So there's a little less tension on those fMR cases, especially when I know that I probably can't get multiple ACE devices in there. Um, but on the ACE devices, you know, there was a very interesting paper. I don't know if you all have seen it. It was actually out of Cedars 2018, where they looked at roughly 350 consecutive MR cases treated with edge to edge repair. And they looked at the mode of failure or the rates of failure. And it was about seven to eight percent FMR and DMR. And it was higher than I thought it would have been. And when you looked at the reason for failure needing reintervention, be it with another edge to edge device or surgery, for FMR, it was as you would expect progression of the underlying disease atrial dilatation, annular dilatation, ventricular dilatation. Not a lot you can do about that. But for the DMR, it was because of the underlying pathology, mostly prolapse, either progressing, like meaning. The, there was more prolapse or it had loosened, come loose. Um, really, there was a perforation. And I think the lesson in that was, you know, we all tended to move towards, oh, if we're done with one device, it looks good, leave it, looks good. I think what we're learning is that for longevity of effect, you might get a good initial reduction, but to hold those DMRs, maybe a second device to stabilize your initial result is the way to go. So I've changed my practice now, and this is where ACE is very useful, where you can put another device in there, hopefully with not a significant increase in gradient, and and just to maintain that result that you're getting acutely to avoid that sort of 8% recurrence rate. To add to your point only, like we have seen the progression. We were saying 50% MR reduction, excellent, everyone out. And now we're having zero MR as much as possible and tolerable. But the question what will happen in the upcoming five years when those patients will come with MS. So we have to keep that a balance, yeah. Please. Oh, thanks for the step by uh, step approach. I do agree with you that Pascal is, is quite easy to use and uh, user friendly. Uh, I share with you the same um, finding that the Pascal, uh, once it's deployed, the gradient's not, you know, there's not much difference when you use Pascal than, you know, the other competitors. Uh, and I'm just wondering to the panel if you have any experience with this, because we were um, scratching. I work in a small center in Switzerland, and we started now, we started our mitra program like two years ago. And uh, we were actually last week, you know, trying to figure out, because we trying to see, we did a, in the same week, a uh, mitra case and a Pascal case. And, you know, and do, we do it with the um, TE guidance. And... Um, during the case, the gradient is absolutely great, and you feel like, oh, the case is good, or I'm happy with the progress. But you know, next day before the charge, you get, a, a, you know, a surprise. And I'm just wondering if you have 
uh, you know, so, an explanation for that. So there's no, it's hard to make an explanation because each case in its, in its own, but at least you can have a trigger warning or like an algorithm that you go through your head before you're leasing the device. First of all, understanding the screening TEE that you're doing in terms of the mitral valve area, the etiology of the MR, and some paper has been suggesting the diameters also to keep it in perspective and where exactly you're gonna put your implant or your, your device. So that's one part. Second part, you have the advantage of having continuous hemodynamic uh, monitoring during the case. So once you have a good hemodynamic response without an increase in the LA pressure, it means mostly that you're in the safe zone. Uh, third of all, with the science or the trials or from the um, subsidy from the co-op in terms of the exactly the gradient, people with the FMR with an area, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 4 or 4.5, they did like four quarters. And even with your gradient might reach uh, 6, 7 plus, even in some of them like a crazy number 13, as long as you have a, in each, of course, you have an FMR status, you have a good area to start with your patient will do fine. There was no impact on rehospitalization or heart failure. But again, going to the extreme of 10 and 13, that's extreme for me. My target now is acceptance of five to seven, depending on your hemodynamics, depending on the situation of the patient. And as much as I possible, I keep my eyes with the anesthesia. So once the patient is off on the table, we are very adherent about you know blocking the patient, slowing the heart rate, uh, putting this in consideration. Because when you reach that area, you know that you're not. There's no way back, and you don't want to push them for surgery for MS. And then they can tolerate some MR, but MS is not good. Thank you. Fantastic discussion. I think we're already two minutes over, yes. so we'll we'll wrap it up. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you.